All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for our main event, our first speaker of the fall, and man, did we get a good one. This is a story that has a lot of ups and a lot of really down downs. I'm excited for you to hear him speak. Please give it up for Dr. Mark Louvier. <clears throat> hey, John. Well, first of all, I wish Violet was still here because I, I asked her if I could wear her boots. You know, I think I can't, I feel underdressed after seeing Violet's nice boots. John, before we start, I do have a question for you. When you were giving your monologue, you were talking about being 30 and that you thought that there were, that you know, that that wasn't so old, but you looked out there and you said you looked at some heads and you saw some people losing their hair. I thought you were looking in my direction, but you I were was. looking at Rowan, weren't you? <laughs> okay, Rowan, that, I just wanted to say, Rowan was a nice kid and I just told him that I wanted to mention him when I was here. He made me feel very comfortable, you and your sister Violet. So, I asked Violet if I could wear her boots tonight, but she didn't think they would fit. <laughs> All right, thanks for having me, John. Yeah, I'm, I, Mark, I'm super glad to have you on. Uh, when Chris, when we, when we brainstorm these seasons, and we talk about, you know, who, who do we want to have on the show? Who can we get? And Chris brought up your story, and we were all like, we got to have this guy. And I think I met Chris at, I, I've given a talk about being in prison over 10 times, 12 or 15 times since I've been out. And I don't know where I met, was it Chris at the Rotary or Lions Club, Lion, Cedar Falls Lions Club? Okay. And he came up afterwards and asked me if I would talk here, and I, I thought it would be a great idea. Yeah, and I'm, I'm super glad that you're here. Uh, watching you come in, you're clearly very popular. <laughs> so it, it was very nice. I saw some of my patients that I haven't seen for a long, patients and friends, and it was very nice to see them. So thanks, you guys, for coming. That was very, very nice. When I've given these talks, I've had a, an outpouring of support from people that I don't normally see. When I got, I worked at St. Vincent de Paul for a little bit, so a lot of people came there to see me. But I'll save that for a little bit. Yeah, so... Kind of diving in, all right? Uh, as I understand your story, and we're going to let you really break this down. You're a doctor. You're a successful doctor. Uh, some of the people here, you were their doctor. Delivered their kids. That was you a big were part of my practice. Very successful. Everybody loved you. Next thing we know, going through a divorce. Things are getting hard at home. We make some new friends, and maybe these new friends aren't very good friends. Next thing we know, we're not a doctor anymore. We're abusing substances and things of that nature. Things as a doctor, you would have told other people, hey, do not do this. This is bad for you. But we're going through a dark time. You find yourself in prison. Right. You find yourself behind bars. So we go from doctor, top of the world. Now we're behind bars. And now we're, we're out of prison. We're rebuilding. And we're here. And so. Gosh, you just told the whole story. I can yeah. go home, man. That's, that's a great job right there. Very, very succinct. So talking about, you know, you were a doctor. What were you, family doctor? What, what was your practice? I was, uh, I was board certified in family practice with an emphasis on obstetrics and pediatrics. That was sort of my love was delivering babies and taking care of kids, although I did take care of the whole gamut from people, you know, from delivery until they died. Um, but my favorite part was OB. So that's when I got to Allen Hospital after doing my residency, there were three obstetricians at Allen, and uh, two of them died within six months of me starting. And so that, all of a sudden, there was this big OB population that was not being served. There was only one, Dr. Bethke was the only one that was left. And uh, so all of a sudden, there was all these moms that, that needed babies to be delivered. The other thing that happened was that I, I um, got involved with the Amish community, because I, was, I tended to be, I went to Grinnell College in kind of a, you know, earthy, kind of background in my history. I'm the oldest of eight kids. And uh, the Amish don't want a lot of intervention. And I, I very much feel that people are able to make their own decisions and to, to choose the kind of health care they want and not to have you know, some didactic, pedantic physician that tells them what they have to do. And so the Amish started coming to me. Plus, I didn't charge them as much as, as normal. <laughs> so I think that was a big part of it, too. So and of course, with the Amish, you all know that was a huge OB practice. But as you said, I was very successful. I was the number one admitting physician at Allen Hospital for a number of years. And uh, I had, had everything going for me. I didn't get married. I got, had my first child when I was 40. I was, uh, when I went to medical school, I was there for the day on how to deliver babies, but I was sick the day they talked about how to make them. So it, took me, <laughs> so it, it did take me a little bit of time. Sorry, you know, I mean, some of us are just a little slower. So I had my first child when I was 40, my second one when I was 42, and ended up getting divorced for a number of other reasons. And it was just, a, it was just an overwhelming experience for me because I had waited so long to have children, was successful, and had money and all that crap. And so I was able to stay home. Dr. Musgrave and Dr. Matt Smith had come with me. And so I was able to 
you know, not have to work so much. I was only working pretty much half time when I was 45 or 47 and still did the deliveries, which is what I wanted to do. And went through this divorce and all of a sudden I'm seeing my kids instead of being there all the time with them, I was there, you get them on Wednesday afternoons and every other weekend. And that was just, that was devastating to me. That was really hard. And I met, met a young lady and, and I mean I had tried, and I'm, I don't shy away from these parts of the stories. I've given this talk many, many times and so there's no questions that you can't, I guess we're not doing questions tonight. It's a different format. Yeah, yeah. So I was going to say, so, you know, you were successful. So do you think the divorce was the turning, like when did the wheels really yes. start falling yes. off. And when I, did we go from riding high to... And I don't, I don't want to, you know, it was my decision. It, I take full responsibility. I don't want to blame it on divorce, but that's what happened. Is that all of a sudden, you know, I had, I had everything in the world, had an airplane, motorcycles, had everything I wanted, and had these kids that were just a wonderful addition to my life. And when all of a sudden I'm going for a whole week without seeing them, so if you have them on a Wednesday night and it's not your weekend, I don't see my kids for another, till the following Wednesday. And the rapport with my ex-wife was miserable. I mean, she would not, you know, I had to be there at 7, had to be at you no know, 7.01, nothing like that. And so it was just really devastating. And, and it was just, you know, it was a hard thing for me to handle. Never was a big drinker. I mean, I dabbled in taking some, you know, smoke some pot in college or something. But it was never a big deal. But someone said, you know, try this. It'll make you feel better. And, I mean, I knew not to do that. But I tried it once and liked it and just got in over my head. And it was, a, it was a terrible, terrible thing, and I knew that it was wrong. And the problem was that it um, wasn't so much that I was doing the drugs, but I had met, because of having money and having where I lived in a nice neighborhood, I met the, some of the guys that were involved in the higher echelons. And there's some things I can't talk about, or people stop and stay and ask questions afterwards. There's certain things I can't talk about because of Mexican cartels and things like that. But I met some guys, and to be nice to them, I, I stored the, the methamphetamine at my house. You know, a normal, normally a gram of meth cost $100. It's cheaper now, but it was $100 at the time. And so I had 13 pounds when I got arrested. It was not mine. 13 pounds had a street value of $987,000. So I had almost a million dollars worth of methamphetamine in my house, which I know was wrong because I was storing it for these guys. But my choices were when I got arrested was to tell who's that, where that came from. And it was it, if it's not mine, it's somebody else's. And I would have to name names. Well, you certainly, you learn quickly when you're in jail or you don't have to go to jail and know this, you just watch TV, but you don't want to name names for Mexican cartel people because my life wouldn't be, I wouldn't last very long. So I took full responsibility for all of that and uh, I owned guns too. So it was a 50 year sentence for owning that much methamphetamine. I had guns in my house, which was, you know, I mean, didn't use them in the commission of anything. I mean, I was just a hunter. And so you got a double sentence for that. So I got a hundred year sentence which was a you know, big sentence. Those of you that know me um, know that when it was in the paper and all that. Big, big thing on the news. When you get a 100-year sentence, there are certain things that you can do with good time and mandatory minimums, et cetera, which I won't go into, but I had to serve a minimum of 10 years. I could have done federal time. The minimum for the federal time would have been probably 18. I might have gotten, gotten less than that, but I, just, I decided to take the, the state time. So it was a 10-year minimum sentence that I had to do. I went to Newton Correctional Facility. I was there for nine years, and then for the last year, went to Mount Pleasant which was considered a minimum facility at that time before I, before I got out. I um, um, then went to Waterloo Work Release Center because if you're in for an extensive period of time, they don't want you to come back out and go straight to home because when you've been in that long, they think there might be a, a hard transition for you to make. So I went to the Waterloo Work Release Facility for, for three months and worked at, at uh, St. Vincent de Paul. I was born and raised a Catholic. Um, part of my experience in prison was coming back to my faith, which we'll probably talk about at the end. So I'll just save that for now. Yeah, so I... That, that's essentially what happened. Yeah, so I wanted to talk about... So, obviously, you, you made some poor decisions, and now we're in prison, and 10 years. So, obviously, the last year maybe was a little easier than the first nine. But what was that experience like? Going from having the world at your fingertips to this small little area yep. that's been issued <clears throat> to you for, for 10 years. What well, was that experience like? John, you? I'd like to tell you that you know, when people, when they watch TV shows, they don't make TV shows about prison as a nice place. You know, they always show the hardest prisons usually and the stabbings and the knifings and the fightings and all the fighting and all that. But very fortunately, Iowa only has nine, has nine prisons. They have a prison population total of about 9,000 people. It's very, it, Iowa's not a dangerous place to go. They have enough guard to, pri guard to prisoner ratio so that, that there's not a lot of violence in Iowa prisons. It's not like Texas, Arizona, and and Alaska are the three big ones, California too. 
So there's not a big problem in Iowa prisons. It, but still, it is an eye-opening experience, except especially for someone who had the world at their fingertips and had all the money in the world and all these crazy material things. Fortunately, very soon after I was even in jail, before I went to prison, Pastor uh, Larson, who um, was a patient of mine, he and Eunice Larson were from Nazareth Lutheran Church. I'm sure a lot of you know who Pastor Larson was, Homer Larson would visit me regularly at prison and really brought me into a more personal relationship with Christ. So as a Catholic, you know, a lot of Catholics don't have that kind of personal experience with Christ. You know, it's more ritualistic. Um, so Pastor Larson helped me come to a better realization of my own faith. And so that was a big turning point for me and really helped me get through the rest of prison. One of the things that, that you can do in prison is that you can do correspondence courses with Bible study groups and with Bible courses. And I, I probably did over 50 of those in prison you know, in, involved in all that stuff. That really, really helped me get through. Loneliness and being, being segregated in prison and, and having all this spare time. And I'm a real type A guy that's always, was always on the go and had to, you know, doing deliveries here and staying up all night and, and seeing 40 people a day in the office. So it's, a, it's really something to all of a sudden be back in a situation where, you know, there's not much to do all day. I was very, very lucky because a couple things. Because of having some money before I went in, um, I was able to buy things in prison. Most guys in prison are there not just for their first time. They've done multiple times. They've been, have a high recidivism rate, which means they go back to prison after, after being in. They get out, they, they mess with their family, they steal money, they steal things from the house and pawn them. So a lot of times they burn their bridges and their families don't support them. And it's very, you know, you only make on an average of 20 to $30 a month in prison. And the thing, you can buy TVs, you can buy clothes, you can buy food and people, and hygiene products and you want to have that. So I was lucky that I had some money and had a very supportive family that was able to help me with that stuff. So I didn't have to endure that. I was able to buy a TV and my own radio and my own clothes and tennis shoes and things like that. The other thing that was nice is that I love to read. I've always been a, a studious person. And so one of my favorite things to do is reading. And you can get books sent in from Amazon or from the publisher. You know, they have the very nice libraries at prison, but you're able to get books sent in. You can't order them yourself, but your family can do that and send them in for you. And I was. That was, very, that was very nice. The third thing was that because of my education, I was able to always get a job in prison. You know, there's, there's laundry jobs, there's kitchen jobs, and there's cleaning jobs, which I was willing to do, and I did some of those when I first got to Oakdale. I mean, I worked in the kitchen, it was no problem. But once I got to the prisons and they found out who I was, I was able to be a teacher. So every prison has to have a GED program, or you know, a, they call it high set now, but for kids that don't have a high school diploma, kids that drop out. So the federal rule is that if you're under 21, you have to go three hours a day in, in working towards your GED. And if you're over 21, it's highly recommended that you spend an hour and a half, hour to two hours a day in school. So I loved, I always loved math and science. And so normally you're just, as, a, as an inmate, you're only allowed to be a tutor. They have teachers from the local community college, DMAC or um, whatever college is nearby the prison. Each of them has their own local community college. And so a tutor's just, the teacher's supposed to teach, and then the tutors are supposed to go over the lessons with the kids. Well, I was lucky enough to get my own classroom, and so the math teacher would do the basic stuff, because I didn't, don't have the most patience in the world, and would do basic fractions, things like that with students. But once, once they got to algebra, trigonometry, geometry, I was able to have my own classroom and have six to eight students all the time, and was able to teach the, the whole time that I was in prison. And of course, I loved that, because that was, I was able to use my head. And the kids were very, very grateful. So. There was over 80 students that, math is the hardest part of the high set of the GED test to pass. You have to do five portions of it. Math is the hardest, and that's the one they could not pass. And so I had over 80 students while I was in, during the time I was in to be able to get their GED. And that was, you know, a really fulfilling thing for me. So, you know, obviously as a doctor and you enjoy working with kids, that must have obviously been very helpful for your psyche in getting through being in prison, getting to feel like a, you have have a have a have a purpose. Right. What do you think that experience would have been like if you really were just a in your cell right. for that, nine hours John, and you weren't treated like right. a doctor? John, that it would have been very very hard for me. I was kind of a celebrity because of having that and because I was a teacher. The other thing, the other two things were that money is very very short in prison. As I said, you only make twenty dollars a month, and usually most guys have to pay child support, so they have to give half of that to child support. So they're living on ten to twelve dollars a month. And they don't, you know, they don't, the food in prison, I'm sure you know, is not very good. And uh, so you want to buy food from the commissary in prison. So if you make $12 a month, it costs ten fifty to rent a TV for a month. So that only leaves you with a couple bucks if you have to rent a TV. To go to the doctor in prison, there's a $3 copay for every time you go, unless you have a chronic condition. If you have high blood pressure, diabetes, they let you go on a regular basis. But if you get sick, if you get a sore throat or something, you know, you got a rash, 
So guys had to pay $3 every time they went, and they'd take that off their books. And so I was a celebrity because they could come to me. Now, I don't have, didn't have a license to practice medicine anymore, but obviously I remembered most of the stuff. I didn't forget it the day I went in prison. And uh, so probably, if I had to estimate, probably 70 to 75% of things that you get, a normal healthy person gets, any kind of medical condition, is self-limiting and go, gets better on its own. It's caused by a virus. You know, it, it, it's not, a, a, not going to be a dangerous thing. So only 20, 25% of the time do you really need to go to the doctor to get a prescription, to get an antibiotic, things like that. So these guys would come to me over and over and say, you know, gosh, doc, look at my rash. Is this, you know, impetigo and I need an antibiotic or is this just something, a viral exanthem, something that'll go, well, they didn't say viral exanthem, I said that. And, uh, you know, <laughs> okay, they, say, man, you went to a really educated prison. You didn't really need to come I mean, to me, <laughs> yeah, geez. Uh, sorry about that. And so, uh, so I saved these guys lots of money and before long the prison guards were coming to me because they had 10 and $20 copays you know, to their family doctor when they got home, and so the prison guards were coming to me, and they weren't supposed to. So that was one thing. The other thing is, is that the first year I was in, in 2008, there was a 24-year-old Mexican fellow who was playing soccer, and those of you might, read, might have read about in the paper, he fell out while he was playing soccer, and there were five, I was walking back across the yard, and there were five guards standing around him, and you know, we're not supposed to get involved in any situation on the yard where the guards are congregated, because they're usually a fight or something, and so, but I knew one of the guards very well, his name was Fresh. So I said, Ron, you know, do you want me to do something with this guy? And he said, yes, doc, please come help us. Because they, you know, they're all trained in CPR, but none of the guards wants to do mouth to mouth or touch an inmate if they don't have to. So I got down and this guy had no pulse and no respiration. He was essentially dead. But I got to him, it was within 30 seconds of him going down. And so I started doing CPR on him, mouth to mouth and CPR. Of course, I got a lot of crap later for kissing a 24-year-old Mexican guy in prison, you know. But, <laughs> but, you know, saved his life, so it was okay. So was able to get an IED, an IED, sorry. An IED is what they use, that's what blows people up in Afghanistan. AED is the defibrillator. Sometimes I get confused. I've been away from it for 10 years, you know. And uh, shocked him, had to shock him twice, brought him around. He's helicoptered out to Iowa City. He ended up with a pacemaker. He had a, a medical condition that he was born with that he would have died. And so the inmates and the guards were very, very grateful. The warden, you know, I got some time off off my sentence because of saving a person's life. And so that, that reputation of happening within the first year, you know, nobody ever messed with me in prison. Nobody, I almost got in one fight, but, but m people were very respectful of me because they knew that I could help them. And so I was very fortunate. But to answer your question, to not have those, those assets would have made it very, very difficult. Very difficult indeed. And even with those assets, I'm, sh I'm sure there was still the, the hard realization of, of being behind bars. I have to ask you, I'm going to deviate from, from mm. some of the questions I had originally planned. You were um, the show, I heard. So yeah, so yeah. Go ahead, you know. Well, I, I, you know, I'm you asking these questions, and I, I feel like you're almost getting off easy a little uh, You bit. know what? Like, oh, yeah, it was I great. Like I, can, I, I, can, I saved a guy. Yeah, and I can tell you're a <laughs> tough cookie, you know, so I gotta, I'm trying to take charge so you can't dax me in or something. So. Yeah, so I, I want to... So after the divorce, you're only seeing your kids once a week. What is that relationship like now? Uh, with your kids. It's not good now. So my wife, normally you get to have your kids come visit you in prison, okay? My wife would have nothing to do with that. She took the kids to a child psychiatrist, child psychologist, um, but while I was still in jail to get a determination that it would be in the children's, not their best interest to not see me. So I did not, be, I was not able to see my children while I was in prison. I had to, I was able to talk to them once a week, but I had, to, it was a constant battle. I had to go, had two separate court cases where they were not answering their phone would not answer the phone when I called them. And so we had to go through all that, and, and it was a terrible, miserable experience. Since I've been out, I've been able to see them. One of them I don't see very much. He, he was the younger of my two boys. Uh, they're now 22 and 18. They both went to Cedar Falls, Ben and David. And David was younger, so I didn't he was seven years old when I was arrested, so he doesn't remember much about me. Ben, my, ben was 10 when I went in, and so I've de I have developed, since I've been out, a good relationship with Ben. He's now in Iowa City, and so I'm able to go see him on a regular basis, and that's a good thing. But it was still, the whole reason I got involved in this is because it was, it was a devastating experience for my kids, and I made it even worse, you know, right. through my own fault. So considering the fact that not getting to see your kids sent you down this dark path, what are you doing for yourself right now, knowing things are getting better, but they're not all there? We went 10 years without seeing the kids. What are you doing for yourself to make sure we don't fall into a situation oh, like that again? Okay. Well, again, I'm very fortunate in that I'm old enough, you know, if I was 20 years old and got out of prison, I wouldn't have been in for 10 years. But if I, a lot of these guys that go to prison when they're 20, they go in for a short period of time. They go in for four months, six months, a year, and they get right back out. They get back into the same group that they were in with before, and they don't have a lot of options. They don't have a lot of money. 
don't have a lot of support, and so they start doing drugs again. Plus getting out, you know, you guys have read all about ban the box in the paper, and it's hard to get a job when you get out of prison, especially for a 20-year-old that has no skills. So, you know, if you have a a, an option of going to McDonald's and making $350 a week, or going back and selling drugs and making $1,000 a week, because it's, it's amazing how much money you can make selling drugs. Not they, that we want you to yeah, yeah, no, yeah, get excited yeah, about no, Yeah, don't anybody do You can that. make how much? No, <laughs> yeah. nothing. You make um, zero dollars. And so it's easy for those guys to get back into it. But I, again, I'm fortunate because I'm, I'm now 62 years old. Um, I have no desire. I mean, I really was not, had a big desire at first. I kind of, I mean, it was my, my fault for getting into it in the first place. But I knew better. And I really know better now. So it's really, I went to my parole officer today. I go once a month to see my parole officer. I get test, drug tested randomly. And I've always passed my drug tests. I was never a big drinker. So it's really not a problem for me. Um, so I really don't, it, it, I mean, I'm very happy now to, to stay away from that lifestyle. I, didn't, I don't really hang around with anybody I knew. Um, when I was at St. Vincent de Paul, I met a lot of people that would either employees or people that were coming in because it's a, you know, it's a store for people that with low incomes that come in. And so I've had, still had a lot of contact with people that I know are doing meth and have been with them you know, as they're doing meth, you know and, know, and know that they're actively doing it. And I really try to work with them. I have, since I've been out, I've been a mentor for one of my, one of the guys that was one of my cellies at, New, at Mount Pleasant. He's down in Quad Cities and just finished a, a six month program at the Salvation Army. He got back into drugs and almost died, was resuscitated with Narcan. And so the judge, instead of sending him back to prison, had him go to the Salvation Army for a six month program. And I've been his mentor and gone down on a regular basis. He just graduated. There's a young lady right now who's a, who is in jail here, who I visit on a regular basis, who did meth that I met since I've been out, and I've been working with her and supporting her. She now got transferred to a, a residence in, in Fort Dodge, an aftercare program. There's a woman who tried to kill herself after doing meth since I've been out, was one of my, one of my colleagues at St. Vincent, and she's now at a residential facility in Fayette. So I'm working with people to try to keep them off drugs and show them that there's a better way to do that. Plus giving speeches, as I've given all these talks you know, across the state of Iowa. Um, I, I, you know, that's very fulfilling to me to hopefully someone will listen out there, young kids will pay attention and not get involved in that. You know, Nancy Reagan had the big mantra about just say no, and it seems so simplistic at, at first, but it really is true. You know, if you just get into a situation, you just have to walk away from it and not get involved in it, and that's really the best way to, to, to do it. You know, once you do this stuff, different people have different drugs. You know, it's alcohol for some people, opiates for other people. I mean, I, I can't hardly take a pain pill you know, because it constipates me. So I don't like opiates. And I mean, drinking, I don't like the way you feel sick. You know, it just happened that meth was something that I sort of have a little ADD probably. And went back when I was a kid in the, in the 60s, you don't, they didn't have Ritalin, I don't think, or we didn't do it. I probably would have been a Ritalin kid because I'm very type A and very motivated and very driven. And so meth was kind of a, meth has, stimulant drugs have a paradoxical effect on people that are a little hyperactive. You know, it makes them calm. So that was a drug that I mean, I knew about it, but I just never tried it. And once I tried it, I liked it. So I just, I just make a, a point to stay away from that, to stay very active. You know, I, I ride my bicycle all the time, ride motorcycles, I travel. My parole officer allows me to travel on a regular basis. And uh, I just read all the time and love giving talks. And so when Chris asked me to do this, I just jumped on it. Well, awesome. So and I heard you, heard you were here, you know, so I yeah. about this new hot show we had going on. <laughs> yeah. Time. So um, we'll, we'll close out uh, with a, with a two-part question for you. Uh, one is a nice short answer, and the other is kind of the heart, uh, kind of what we're getting at the series. So that your two-parter is, what is your job now? Because obviously you can't go back and be a doctor. So what are you doing now? And then how has God been working in your life as you've been working on rebuilding your life, your friendships, people that I'm sure wanted to get far away from you that felt betrayed, that how are you... How is God helping okay. you through that? Uh, first of all, you should know by now that I probably can't give a short answer to anything you said. Oh, that's I, what am I doing? That's why now? I gave you two questions at okay. once because I knew I wasn't right. able to cut in. The, uh, the short <laughs> answer is, what am I doing now? So I came out work for St. Vincent de Paul, and then I did that for a year and a half. They had some some issues with the executive director and the boss, and so um, I decided to leave. Um, they asked me; they fired him. They asked me to run St. Vincent de Paul, but I didn't want to do it on a full time basis. So I so I'm quote retired now. Um, I am able to. Get, I would have been able to get my medical license back, and I can. But they. But I would have to do a two-year residency because I was away for ten years. You know, there are certain things that you don't forget. I was talking to one of my patients here. You know, delivering a kid. I mean, that's pretty basic. That doesn't change. Even though I was away for ten years, there might be a couple new drugs that really aren't. But you know, with hypertension and diabetes, there would be new drugs that I would have to learn. So when I came out at six, when I was 
60 when I got out of prison. So I'd, I would have been 62, or if I did it now, I'd be 64 if I'd spent two years. I really didn't want to go back and, and do that. I don't really have to, so I thought I would just be retired. I did go out to, just because of being in the winter and board, I went out to Hawkeye Tech and, and took the truck driving course. So I got my CDLA license at Hawkeye. And uh, so I, I, and I haven't done it yet, but I'm probably going to do that just on, an, on a temporary basis or a part-time basis because it seems really, you know, I always rode motorcycles, flew airplanes, never drove a semi, but it's one of the coolest things in the world to, to parallel park a semi is really neat. <laughs> so for, but right now, as of today, I'm retired and I don't have a job right now. What my relationship with God has, has changed immensely. I talked a little bit about Homer Larson, my, my sort of conversion experience, but having that faith in prison, and, and you always hear these prison conversion stories of guys that find Jesus and find God, and then, of course, they get out and they, they go back. That won't happen to me. I mean, mine, mine quote, took. Um, to have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ in prison, especially when you have the time to pray, when you re it really teach it, you really learn to pray and to have that quiet time every night. You know, you're by yourself all the time. You have a, well, you're never by yourself in prison, believe, unless you're in solitary confinement. But you know, you have a lot of quiet time and, you, and a lot of time to reflect on your past life and on what your present life is now and what your future life will be. And so I used that time to make sure that my future life was going to be one that was very close to God. Having seven, bro seven brothers and sisters, we were always very close. And my mother's, my, my dad, deceased before I went to prison. My mother's 86 and I'm very close to her. I'm allowed to leave, from a parole standpoint, I'm allowed to leave one week a month, seven to 10 days a month, and I do that. I go back to see my family. Most of them are in Indiana. I'm go I just saw my parole officer today and got approval to go next Thursday for 11 days, stay with my sister, do some landscaping work, have my mom's coming down there, my sister, one from Florida's coming up, and uh, we will all be together as a family, and we've done that probably three, t four times a year since I've been out. And they're all very religious too, and so it's it's a really a good group experience when I get together with my family. It's been a, it's been a great time. Giving these talks has been fulfilling. It's just been a really I've I've been very very happy since I've been out. Well, awesome, Mark. Well, I'm glad we could have you on the show tonight to talk about your journey, what you've been through, uh, because the the thing I I like the most about doing this series, and as we talk about God, and as we look through countless examples in the Bible, is it it does not matter what you've done or where you've been. It is never too late to start that relationship with Christ, to receive that love from Christ, and to start on a new path, to move forward in a way uh, that, that brings honor to, to Christ's name and that, and that makes the world a better place. And I'm, I'm thankful that you have had that transformation, that yep. despite where you've been, you've come out on the other side. Um, and even more so encouraging that is to hear you talk about trying to help others uh, in similar or, or worse positions. Uh, obviously, not everybody gets to go into prison as a doctor and, and maybe right. have that help them out. Uh, some people go into prison with nothing and, and they risk leaving with nothing. Right. And to hear that you understand, hey, I got out and I'm okay, I'm on a better path, that you're reaching back, uh, not only shows how much you've changed, but it shows how much God has changed you and turned your eyes yep. uh, towards your brothers. Let me add one thing, John, to the, to the audience. If any of you, uh, and again, I talked to some of my patients that were here who, ha who have an experience with someone that they know and love in prison. If any of you know anybody in jail or prison, the, th the number one thing that I have to point out that kept me going or that was so important to me was having visits. It's amazing, you know, when you're, when you're you know, torn away from your family and from the rest of society and you're put in this place, you know, this little microcosm that's crazy out there that is like its own little world, to have people from the outside come and visit you. Even if it's through the glass in jail, you know, we have to talk on a phone. In most prisons, you still have contact visits where you can go into a room and sit and hug and play cards and buy some candy from a machine. Do that. If you know anybody that's not, if, even if they're not that good of a friend, if they're a friend of the family, offer to go visit them, and they will love you. It's an amazing, amazing experience. Write letters to them. You know, they, they, we have every state and federal prison pretty much has email now, and so you can email. But go to visit people in prison. You know, as, you know, one of the things that Jesus talked about was visit. You know, take care of the poor, take care of the needy. Visit the, you know, take care of the sick. Visit those in prison. You know, it 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 it, it made a huge difference in my life. And every one of those guys loves to have those visits. They talk about it. they talk about it starting about Wednesday because the visits are on the weekend. They start talking about who's coming to visit them, to their to their cellies. And then when the vi the day comes, I mean, everybody's all excited. Everybody shave. You know, the guy shaves. You know, they brush their teeth. They take a shower which they don't always do all the time, and uh, get all ready for that visit. And then, you know, there, there's, you know, there's a big denouement after that, you know, until the following week. So really, if I could impress that upon you guys. It's been a pleasure to be here and, and to share my 
share my testimony. It's been a pleasure to have you, Mark. And, and with that, that does conclude our service. So I want to give a round of applause to our guest, Mark Levier. Yeah. I, I don't have to sing or dance or anything right now. No, okay. no, no, no. I don't no, know if you can play all. a song.